We good to go? We've been spending, I think this is our 14th lesson in our series on universalism. And uh, along the way, it hasn't always been obvious we're talking about universalism because really the issue that I've been trying to do is to strengthen you regarding the doctrines that universalism struggles with and uh, where their errors are at so that you won't only be guarded against the error of universalism, but other teachings that arise in different belief systems that affect these things. We've dealt with what sinners deserve and how there's nothing that we deserve from God, which is, should, should be the, the, the predecessor to understanding grace, is that you don't deserve anything from him. He does it all. He gives it freely to you. Uh, we, we talked about the reality of hell, that hell exists. We cover the verses in the Bible that just say that it does, uh, refusing the error that it does not exist at all. And we've seen throughout the way that when you, you cover these issues, atonement and the need for faith and what grace actually is, it requires you to open your Bible and to see what it says and to hold it as the authority of what is true. <clears throat> and a lot of universalists, not all of them, but a lot of them simply do not take the scripture as their final authority. They'll use it as input, but they, they, it is not the final word on these things. Instead, they'll trust their own conscience or trust their own reason or trust their own idea of love. Um, because scripture just gives them sort of an input, but isn't, isn't the final word on it. And they have to take that position because the scripture talks about hell and judgment and damnation and vengeance and these terrible things that occur as a result of sin. And they're terrible things, by the way, because of us. They're not terrible because of God. God is terrible when he judges sinners, and he does that to maintain righteousness and holiness and protect the innocent, quite frankly. And so we've dealt with that along the way. And so, this morning, I want to deal with a subject uh, that really is the true issue that most universalists have, which is the, the time of uh, how long you spend in hell. How long is hell? The duration of eternity and punishment in hell. Okay? And when talking about an issue like this, I, I always feel like I get the same feeling that I get when, when my son, who, who I'm teaching not to ask the the terrible question when you're driving in a car on a long journey, and the question you all know as a parent is, are we there yet? You know, are we there yet? And uh, I, I've tried a new tactic recently of just saying yes. And I can see he thinks through that because he knows we're not. And he, what just happened there? Because he knew I was going to say no. So I just say yes. But the, the, when the, the kids and children ask, you know, are we there yet? You know, this is taking too long. They're, they're just being impatient to get to the journey. And the conflict with the parent is, is if you could snap your fingers and be there, you know, you would. But you're bound by the laws of physics and the speed limit and everything else in reality. And this is, this is kind of what I like is talking to universalists. It's like the child in the back seat saying, hey, can't we just love, love, love everyone, get saved? You're going... You want to say yes. You really want to say yes. But you're bound by scripture. You're bound by reality. And so this is where we find ourselves. And so we have to confront the reality that no, we're not home yet. And, and, and yes, there's a hell. And yes, it's eternal. And yes, sinners who do not repent, who not trust the gospel, who not receive God's grace freely, are not saved from that damnable condition that they'll be, find themselves in if they don't receive the free salvation by God's love through Jesus Christ. And this is why we preach, communicate that truth. And so this is where I find myself in talking about a subject like this, how long is hell? Um, we find throughout the last couple of months of teaching this that when you give time to scriptures, my pun is intended there, when you give time to scriptures, universals tend to go away. Okay, because they, they want to talk to you and you know, approach to you uh, regarding your feelings for other people. And you have feelings for other people. And that's not bad. That's good. In fact, God tells us to love our neighbor. And yet, our understanding of truth in Scripture is not people-centered. It's God-centered. It's truth-centered. And so if that means the truth is against people, guess who wins? Truth is the answer, not the people. And so it's not, it, would that all people were righteous and all people were innocent, and thus God could justly and righteously and holily bless us all forever. He's offering to do that by his grace, but the reality is, is that people have refused that, okay, and that sin exists. So what we've come so far in our, our teaching for the last 13 weeks is talking about the, the reality of judgment, the reality of suffering, the, the need for faith, and so there's saved and unsaved people, and the reality of torment and what that would look like. We talked about holy hell a few weeks ago and talked about um, do people even exist in hell and how the, if the Bible teaches that? And so at this point, we've come through these teachings so that 
we have an understanding that should be accepted by our study, but also by the universalists that are still tagging along here with our study, is that the unsaved, damned, suffering, torment, and destruction and judgment of hell is, is now proven. It's accepted. Okay, th 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 Those points are not the subject today. They've already been discussed. Right? And, and so this leaves us with the real, true complaint. If you boil it all down, the true complaint universalists have is not about hell existing if they're trying to be biblical at all, because hell exists in the Bible. It's not about God's judgment, because God's righteous and holy, and the Bible teaches that clearly. It's not about that suffering results from those who are wicked that receive punishment. Yeah, punishment hurts. The Scripture talks about that. It's not that they're saved and unsaved. That's clear in the scripture. These are all clear. But the real complaint is, how long does this punishment last? How long is hell? Okay, and that's really the rub, is that they don't deserve, people don't deserve, even sinners and wicked people and the damned don't deserve eternity in hell. That hell is so long. If God came down from heaven in the scripture and said that hell would be a two-week torment to pay for your sins, I'm pretty sure a lot of, there'll be more universal that say, yeah, maybe, that's, that's, that's reasonable, right? Because this is, we'll see next week, this is actually a position that a minority, but uh, the group that tries to be biblical takes. They say, well, hell's real, and people will suffer there, uh, but it's a limited time, and then they're done. They cannot and will not accept an eternal, final destination in damnation, right? And that's what distinguishes universalism from, uh, from biblical truth, quite, quite frankly, but... Um, so this is the true complaint. How long is hell? How long are people damned? How long will they suffer? It's how long? How much time is there? Right? And if you're a universalist, you cannot believe the answer to that, if you're a universalist, is forever, is everlasting, is eternal. That's not the answer if you're a universalist. So if you think, well, how long are the damned in hell if you're in hell and you're not saved? And your answer is, well, it's forever. You're not a universalist. Right? You see the issue there. Universalists do not accept those words. In fact, in the Bible, universalists use most often the concordant version translated by a, a corrupted dispensationalist. I say that because he's not mid-exensational. He doesn't rightly divide that way. Uh, but he translate, retranslated the Bible. He called it the concordant Bible, according to his own translation and theory. Um, they've removed these words. Forever, everlasting, eternal does not exist at all about anything in that book. Okay, those words don't. And so time and duration of hell is the issue I'll talk about today, um, which is usually what they want to talk about initially. There was so much remedial work that we need to go through to remove those other issues from this point. It was necessary to spend 12 weeks on this. I hope you benefited from it. So let's describe what the Bible says about how long. About how long is hell? And at the very first uh, point on the outline there, I have to put this huge warning in all caps, because when you try to turn to the Bible and you open your Bible to see what it says about how long hell is, this is where universalism will require you, require you, require you to retranslate your Bible. And not only your Bible, but every popular, in fact, majority, even unpopular, English Bibles. Every one. You have to retranslate them. Why? Because you can't open any Bible. You say, I'm a King James believer. Good. I agree with you. But for this issue, you don't even have to be. If you're an ESV believer, NIV believer, you can't even open those Bibles. They're all wrong because when you open the Bible, it will talk about eternal damnation, eternal judgment, everlasting punishment. But Universalist refuses those words. They have to be changed. They, they have to have been translated wrongly. And then that's, that's the idea. So here's the warning, that it will require retranslation. And I've taught you before, and hopefully you, you accept this as a, as a true principle of operation, when you, when you see a teaching requires you retranslate the Bible to teach it, warning, red flag, Amen. right? The Bible is the authority. You don't change it to match the teaching. You get your teaching from it. Amen. Now the response to that is, well, what if your Bible is translated wrong? That's a valid question. Which is why we get to the point of Bible belief and the need for preservation of God's words. And how do you know which Bible is correct? Because Bible versions do affect major doctrines. This is testimony of it. Yeah. If you have their version, you will not believe an eternal, everlasting, forever anything. Okay? I say anything because we'll talk about life later. Like, it's not just hell. It's like there's no eternal life. Is there? What is it? They don't have the word. What do they call it? They call it something else. The concordant Bible changes forever, everlasting, eternal to the words eon, eons, and eonian. You ever heard these words? 
These are English words transliterated directly from the Greek, aeon, but it's eon, eons, and eonian. Eon, an eon of time, right, eons. Much easier to understand than eternal and forever and everlasting, right? So if you hear someone, if you're talking to someone and they're using that type of language, like, it, well, that, 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 that eternal there, that's translated wrong. The Greek word's aeon, and it should, or aeon, it should be eon in the English. You're talking to someone that's read, been influenced by, or is universalist. That's just, that's what it is. Okay, so just as that. If you look up the word eon in a dictionary, what you'll see it defined as, and by the way, I, I mentioned before a warning that they'll retranslate every Bible in English, but also they'll refuse every lexicon too. By lexicon, I mean dictionaries and reference materials. Because when you look up the boards in the dictionaries, they'll also be against their position. So they've got their own Bible and their own lexicons. So again, you, you see how this is troublesome. You said, Justin, why don't you start with this 12 weeks ago? <laughs> so I wanted to strengthen you with the, the doctrinal issues of atonement and those realities. But uh, this is why universalism is, should, is, is, is wrong. Because yeah. their issue is the length of hell, and to teach what they teach, you have to reject most every translation of the Bible. Um, I would say including Greek, but I'm not going to argue Greek with you here this morning. Okay. Eon, in your dictionary, English word means age. Uh, not the age of how old you are, but an age, a period of time, right? An age. It means a duration of unspecified length. An eon, a duration, a duration of time of unspecified length. And so if it's a week, that's a duration of time that is specified, not an eon, right? But an eon would be a, a long time or a time that's not known. So how long will it take you uh, to cook dinner? I don't know, <laughs> an eon or something. That's a bad use of it. But duration of unspecified length, which by the way, I'd like to point out that that definition would also possibly include forever. Because if it's unspecified length, then what if it's a really, really, really long time without an end? Well, it's unspecified when the end will be, therefore forever is included in a duration of time. Well, that's fine length, but this is the definition that universalists will, will also use for eon. It's, a, uh, it's an unspecified length of time. Usually they'll try to lean on that length of time issue and say, well, it's unspecified, so we can't say for sure that it's eternal. It could be shorter, we just don't know. Well, if we don't know, then it could be forever. Right. And so maybe we need some more input rather than just this one word. Webster, ironically, and his definition of eon mentions how it's used by Platonists in their philosophy uh, to talk about God or the Gnostics. And now, why it's ironic is because the Universalists will claim that the Platonists, and this is getting into philosophy here that is unneeded for your understanding, but Plato and the Greeks, that they invented hell. That's, that's one of their rhetoric, that they invented hell. It's ironic is that the eon word they use, Webster talks about the Platonists using in their philosophy to describe God. Meanwhile, the Oxford English Dictionary which is the standard British English dictionary of the 20th century. It took 70 years to create this book. It's an interesting history. If you've ever read the history of the OED, um, millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of words in this book, and it describes the history of the words. It defines the word eon as an immeasurable period. Immeasurable period. The whole duration, eternity, or everlasting. These are valid definitions to the word eon. So they don't use the word eternal, because that's pretty definitive, eternal. Eon, maybe it doesn't mean that. Well, possibly not, but possibly so. So we can't refuse it either. Dictionary.com adds to their definition, along with age and a measurable period of time, that in astronomy, an eon means one billion years. I thought that was interesting, because if eon does mean one billion years, which is defined time, obviously, but that's a really long time, okay, um, it's longer than creation has been around. You're not an evolutionist, right? And so even if you spend an astronomical eon in hell, that's a long time. We'll do this next week, right? And so all the arguments about hell being a terrible means of punishment and God's love and you wouldn't let people go there go away if you use the word eon referring to a long period of time longer than say, I don't know, five minutes, but millions and billions of years especially. What's the word eternity? How is that defined in your dictionary? Well, it's defined as a duration or continuance of time without a specified end. Does that sound familiar to you? Sounds like eon, only more clear because how many times have you used eon in your conversation? 
<laughs> eternity is something we all understand. Yes, they're both English words. You should understand English words. Yes, but eternity communicates a duration or continuance of time without an end. Okay. After defining the words in human dictionaries, of course, human dictionaries are our standard, the Bible is always your best dictionary when it comes to words. So if you could find in the Bible how it defines its own words, that's much better. Because the Bible is inspired by God, so if the Bible defines the word for you, inspired definition? Yeah. There's four times in your King James Bible that the word ages show up. And they don't always refer to eons, but eon is, is defined as age. And <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Notice the context in Ephesians 2, a passage you're all familiar with. Paul says that in the ages to come, in the eons to come, right? Ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. In the ages to come. Well, is that just like for a period of time in the future? And then God's done showing kindness and grace to us? The verse is talking about forever, in the future, mm -hmm. ages to come, right? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. Talk about the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Are we to read this verse as that it wasn't known for a brief period of time or some smaller period of time in the past, but there was a time in the past where it was known. Is that how we're supposed to read that? Or is Paul saying, it was never known before? Like, never. Forever in the past was not known. Well, yeah, that's what he's talking about. And the ages, other ages, that's already happened. In fact, all the other ages, right? Ephesians 3, 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. The concordant version says that there's glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Well, that, that, that is a little different. Through, through, from eon to eon, the eons of the eons. Which I go, yeah, that's very insightful. This one says, throughout all ages. How many ages are excluded from that? None. Is there any period of time that is excluded from that verse throughout all ages? Right? It's the context. You don't need to even define the word. The context defines it. It says, world without end, the glory by the church of Jesus Christ. When does that stop? And is there a time in the future where, you know, God stops getting glory from the church? Just, it'll last for a while, an unspecified while, but then it's over. No, I think Paul is saying, like, forever in the future, God gets glory by the church through Jesus Christ. That's the context here. Now, I bring up these passages which do not talk about hell because the, the same use will be applied to hell. And say, well, hell, it's, we don't know how long it is, but it's, it's not forever. You could tell from context how long that word is supposed to be. Okay, Colossians 1, 26. Now, again, I'm teaching you this from context, and no doubt people will say, well, why don't you go to the Greek and go to the original language? Because I'm talking to you who are not Greek speakers. I'm not even a native Greek speaker. It's like, this is not how that works. You're trying to communicate language, and I'm trying to show you how you can define words without being intimidated by not being a linguist. Amen. Study your Bible in the context. It will show you what it's talking about. This is how translation works as well. Like, do you translate a word to word? Yes, you do, concordant, word to word, but you also have to consider the context, right? The King James Bible deliberately in their preface, their translator said, we do not translate every word exactly the same every time, which is contrary to a Knox Concordant translation philosophy, because that's not how you do it. You don't even speak that way. Every time you have the same thought, do you say the same exact word every time, or sometimes you just use different words? This is not how language works. In a dictionary, a word is defined by different words. That's, that's how language works. So using a word, a different word for the same word in different places helps you define words. Okay, so you, you can use the Bible for this. Look at Revelation 118. Let's see if we can figure out how long this period of time is, this duration he is here in Revelation 118 without knowing and consulting a dictionary. We're just going to read the context and see what we think the author is saying here. Is he trying to communicate some unspecified yet limited period of time or forever? Don't be biased by the English word now. Just read the context. Revelation 1, verse 18. Fear not, Jesus says. This is Jesus. John sees his visitor Jesus here. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive 
forevermore is the English, but that's the word we're trying to figure out. What does that actually mean? I was alive, I'm dead, and for a specified limited period of time, forever. Jesus is, the whole phrase here is past, present, future, all time, on the first and the last. That's the, that's the context. Amen. So evermore is correct. Forevermore. There's never a time where he stops being the first and the last, the one whom life comes from. Speaking of Jesus, Hebrews 13, verse 8. You know, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and for a limited yet unspecified period of time. No, he's the same yesterday, forever, today, and forever in the future. Past, present, that's what Hebrews 13, 8 is communicating. That's what it's saying in the context. So to translate a word that you say, well, it actually means it's unspecified. It is specified in the context. So it's correct to call that forever. All right, look at Luke 133. Another example of the context defining, giving more definition and specificity to the word. You do this naturally, by the way. When you read things and you don't know what a word exactly means, how do you know what it means? You read around it in the context. You're trying to figure out what they're saying to give you some sort of framework for what it means. And it can add nuance and understanding to a word that otherwise would be more ambiguous. Luke 133. This is the prophecy about Jesus, and how he shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now that's the word in question here, because remember they take out the word forever. How long is this? Is it forever, or is it an eon? And it says eon in the concordant version, which is an unspecified duration of time. But look what the verse says. He shall reign over the house of Jacob for an eon, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. If you make it eon, eon means no end in this verse, yeah. right? No end means eternal, everlasting, forever, without end. You see, the context tells you what it means. Forever is a pretty good word there. It's just fine, you know, to, to put that there. Now, these are just showing you how you can define a word without a dictionary. I, I gave you the dictionary definition. I've given you the biblical definition of the words in these contexts, forever and, and eternal and evermore. Now, I need to show you the verses in the Bible about how long hell is. Okay, because whenever you bring up these verses, that's why I went through this, 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 this uh, description of the definition. It, it will be told you that those words don't mean that. Well, you, you can read in the context what it means. Look at Jude, the book of Jude, verse 11. How long is hell? How long is this punishment of the unsaved damn? How long is the suffering? How, how long will they be there? Now, I, I got to preface this a little bit, knowing that Technically, the reality is that hell and the lake of fire are different. So hell has a terminus. It has an end, okay? And that hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire. So when I speak about how long is hell, I'm speaking broadly about how long is the time in which the damned will be damned, whether it be in hell or the lake of fire, how long is that? Okay, does the lake of fire ever end? Does their damnation ever end? Does their judgment, their, their standing ever end that way? That's what I'm referring to, Okay. Popularly speaking, most people understand, don't make that distinction. It takes someone who reads their Bible to know, oh, wait a minute, lake of fire is not hell. Yeah, but it's still burning in judgment in the place of condemnation. Jude verse 11. Woe, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and uh, perished in the gains of Cory. I got the wrong verse. Oh, no, I don't. Verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds there without water, carried about of winds. These, uh, these are the condemned. Okay? Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Okay, they're referring to the fallen angels, but blackness of darkness forever. Peter says the same thing in 2 Peter 2, verse 17. Look at Revelation 14. Blackness of darkness, how long is that? Forever, is what the word says. Revelation 14, verse 10. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, the mark of the beast in his forehead or in his hand, 
By the way, Revelation is not describing this dispensation. We are not looking for the mark of the beast. Amen. Salvation is not contingent upon whether or not you receive a mark in your hand or your forehead or not. Okay? Which I know the, 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 the beast seekers will be yeah. weeping and gnashing of teeth at that comment and wailing because they think I'm damning people to hell if they accidentally take the mark. That's not how it works. Okay? Revelation is not talking about you. It's talking about Israel, and God's already marked his people by this point. But Revelation 14, it does say those who do worship the beast and not God. By the way, in Revelation, there's also angels flying around saying worship God. So there's a choice. It's not, whoops, got a credit card by the wrong company. Right? Yeah. Whoops, got the shot. You know, this is, <laughs> that's not how it is. Revelation 14, there's an angel lying around saying worship God. Then there's this guy saying, nope, follow me. I'll give you food. What's the angel doing? He's not giving you food. Anyway, Revelation 14, verse 10, the same, the same who does this shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, in the cup of his indignation. They'll receive judgment from God, punishment. And he shall be tormented with fire. Torment is a description of punishment. We've covered that before. With fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. We've already covered that truth. We're talking about time today. How long? And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Not just forever, but forever and ever. Okay. And they have no rest, nor uh, rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, whosoever receives the mark of his name. They have no rest day or night. Meaning that they're conscious, by the way, because they have no rest. Right? If you're unconscious in this punishment, if, if you're just dead not feeling and the punishment is just being poured out on something unconscious, like a chair or something, it, it's conscious torment there in Revelation 14. So whatever context that is, it's conscious torment. Revelation chapter 20. Here we have the judgment at the great white throne after the thousand-year millennium. And we covered this verse before in our series. I want to focus on how long is this punishment that the devil and Satan, after his defeat at the battle there uh, of Christ, when he brings down fire from heaven, that they, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. If the question you have is about why, is they, why are they tormented, go back to our previous lessons. The real issue people have is the forever and ever. Right. Now, they won't argue much about this verse because this is the devil and the false prophet and the beast, which are people. Okay? They'll be tormented forever and ever. They'll cast the lake of fire. Right? That's why I made the distinction earlier. I'm talking today about all that. Okay? So... There's no gotcha. Well, technically, hell is last forever. I'm talking about lake of, the whole damnation, the whole judgment of God. How long does that last? And the lake of fire, he's thrown in there. When does he get out? When does that stop? Right, it says forever and ever, is what the Revelation 20, verse 10 says. Hebrews 6, verse 2, the author of Hebrews says, do we need to go back to those first things? I'm paraphrasing here. Do we need to go back to those first things and discuss things like baptism and the doctrines of Christ? Hebrews 6, verse uh, 1. He says, Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Like, Hebrews says, let's move on from this. It's, these are foundational things. Moving on. If you don't understand the judgment of God and how God is righteous, or here the eternal judgment of God, how he's eternally righteous in his judgment, then you, you don't got a foundation built properly, right? Uh, Mark 3, 29, Jesus is talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, and it says, he that commits the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost will be in danger of eternal damnation. So he says, you can blaspheme me. Jesus says, you can blaspheme me. They killed him. And that was not, even when they killed Jesus, that was not the reason why God would damn people to hell. Sins were, of course. He would send the Holy Ghost to Israel and say, repent through the Holy Ghost. If they refused and rejected the Holy Ghost, blasphemed him, there's no fourth person of the Godhead. There's no other opportunity. Hebrews goes on to say there's no other sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 26. Right, let's look at Hebrews 10, 26 real quick here. If we sin willfully after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, and by the way, Hebrews is talking to the Hebrews, not to the body of Christ in this dispensation. I'm on a new covenant relationship here, that once they received and tasted the heavenly gift and the Holy Ghost and that kingdom to come, if they sin willfully after they received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. We'll flesh this out next week. And whether there's hope in hell or not. Can you be saved out of hell? But this week is just how long is their condition in hell? 
Well, unchanged, it will be forever. You see? The only question that remains then is, well, can you be saved out of hell? And this is where the universalist is cornered. They get cornered to this, this position, if they're trying to be biblical, that, yeah, hell exists, torment exists, it's a long time, um, but it won't be forever. Because they can get saved out of it. Well, we'll deal with that next week. But Hebrews 10 says there's no more sacrifice for sins. So Christ was the only sacrifice. So his sacrifice applies to people in hell too? Gets them out of there? I mean, what is that? We'll deal with that next week. But there's no more sacrifice. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. 2 Thessalonians, here's Paul talking about Christ's future return. How Christ will return. He'll be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Paul's actually alluding to the same visions that John saw in Revelation. The description of the events that of Christ's return in Revelation 19. He says, The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Know not God. What does that mean? People are just ignorant? That's not what it's talking about. Knowing not means being ignorant. We're talking... To know God means to know his righteousness. Yeah. To know not God, and the Bible is referring to you walking contrary, and that's sin. Right? So to them, these are sinners here, which we're all sinners. You didn't know God until you trusted the gospel, until you knew him, and thereby saved by faith in what he did. But those who know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I said a few weeks back. And people go to hell for two reasons. They choose to go there. One, is, one reason is for their sins, which people choose to commit. And number two, they're refusing the terms of salvation. That's, I got that from this verse right here. He says that he'll take vengeance on them that know not God, their sin, and that obey not the gospel. Because they can believe, you can believe and be saved. You can be saved from hell, from the length of it, from all of it. And it says in verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Everlasting destruction is the punishment. Paul is specifically speaking to the term how long the punishment is. Everlasting. Right. The Old Testament in Daniel 12, speaking about Israel's return as a nation, speaks about some who will resurrect to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. How long is their contempt? Everlasting. The word is in your Bible. Matthew 25, 41. And you can define the word by context as well. Matthew 25, 41. This is Jesus speaking here about uh, a future judgment when he returns. He'll judge the nations. And he'll say unto them on the left hand, those on the right hand who did the deeds that were required, they get the kingdom come prepared from the foundation of the world. But those on the left hand that did not do what was required, depart from me, ye cursed. So we're, this is the right audience here. We're trying to ask a question about the damned, not the saved. Okay, those who are subject to God's judgment and punishment, not saved by Christ. He says, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. We covered before the preparation and how he prepared this everlasting fire for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for people, but people who sin face the same judgment into everlasting fire, fires of eternity. In Matthew 25, verse 46, verse 45, they'll answer saying, um, verse 44, Lord, when we saw thee uh, hungered or thirst, when did we see you hungry or thirst? We didn't do these things against you, is what they're saying. We didn't offend you with our crimes. Now, it's interesting. We'll, come up later, we'll talk about later how God can justly judge people for eternity. And one of the reasons is because you've offended and sinned against God. Not finite beings, but an infinite being. And that's the objection raised here. He says, we didn't do things, things. When did we see you? When did we offend you? God answers, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Which is interesting. So God counts, apparently, their response to people who, in the, 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 the creation, bore the image of God, in the case of Israel, or God's people, in this case, how they respond to Israel here and God's people is how they respond to God. This happens in the Bible. This is why, uh, I've repeated this multiple times to you in the past, how in the, in the law, the punishment and the extent of the law for punishment of disobedient children was death, when they dishonored their parents. Because one aspect of parenthood is that God delegates authority and responsibility that is to him and honor that's to him to parents, which is why children should honor their parents. Because how, they treat, how you treat your parents is a reflection of how you'll treat your father in heaven. 
right? And thus, the extent of the punishment is a, a longer punishment for disobeying your parents than, say, doing some other crime in the Old Testament. Okay. And so here's the same thing. God has Israel, his people, he's my chosen people, the people through whom I've spoken, the people who I've given my law and the oracles. They have this advantage. They're representing me. And how you treat them is how, you're gonna tra- how I judge you treat me. Okay. Jesus gives us in the parables quite often. He says, uh, you know, a man sent a servant. How they treated his servant, you know, he took offense to. It's the same thing. Okay. So they said, Jesus says, as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And these shall go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Notice in the same verse, you have the righteous going to eternal life, life forever, and the wicked here going to everlasting punishment. So there is a time element to both, a duration of time. One concerns the life given to the righteous, the other the punishment to the wicked. In no place in this verse is there indication that the wicked can be saved from this punishment or that it will stop. In fact, it's compared to the nature of life given to righteous, which is eternal. Amen. And so this verse has been one of the strongest evidences to define the length of time for the punishment because they don't get life eternal. People say, well, isn't it possible that the people get eternal life, but these people get temporary punishment? Well, that'd be a weird reading of the verse. And the point that he's saying is that they do not get life eternal because they're not righteous. And if you don't get eternal life, then what happens to you during the duration of time in which the righteous are living, which is eternity? You're getting punished. You're cursed for the same duration of time. So it's interesting when you speak about life eternal in the Bible, the flip side to that is not life eternal. It's still eternal, meaning this duration of unspecified time. How long is eternity, we could ask? Well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say how long. Like, how many months are in eternity? There's no count to them. It's immeasurable. It's indefinite. Yes, that's what eternity is. That's what forever is. That's what everlasting is. It's without end. Okay? In fact, let's define immortality. Look at Romans 1, or 1 Timothy 1, 17. It's interesting sometimes, and I don't recommend that you have to study at all a concordant version of the Bible. It's really not a very good translation. Um, I say that my limited understanding of translation knowledge, but it really isn't a very good one. But in 1 Timothy 1.17, it's, it's fun, funny sometimes to read the, the gymnastics that are performed around some of these passages that speak about forever and eternal. 1 Timothy 1.17 Paul says, now unto the king eternal. Now he says in verse 16 that he's a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Christ to life for an unspecified but limited period of time. No, to life everlasting. Now unto the king, the king of, who, of an unspecified and yet limited period of time. No, eternal king. Immortal. That one they don't touch. Immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory for eons and eons. We don't really know what the specified time that is. It means forever. Glory to God forever and ever is what that means. He doesn't cease getting glory. God's purpose, even the universes will claim, is not that in eternity he doesn't get glory. He gets glory forever. But apparently in their translation, there's a lot fewer proofs of that since you've got to replace the word forever with something more unspecific. Right? Meanwhile, First thing 117, it says God's eternal. The king's eternal. He's immortal. What's immortality? Mortal means subject to death, right? Immortality means life that never ends. It's life without death. If you have life and you never die, you're immortal. It's life without end. What do you call the duration of time that has no end? Eternal, forever, everlasting. You see how that works? That's how def- definitions work. Okay? Romans 2, 7. Paul says in Romans 2, about God's judgment, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's the reward for their patient continuance. So what's the converse reward for the negative outcome? Unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, Indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish 
for an unspecified but limited period of time. Like this is not the comparison here in the context. There is a final determinate outcome for the righteous and for the wicked. That's what Romans 2 says. Amen. There's no indication that those in Romans 2.8 who obey not the truth are going to be saved forever or at any time. In immortality, life is life that without death it never ends. That means mortality is when life ends, it ends in condemnation, and that condemnation doesn't change. For the condemnation not to be eternal, for the judgment not to be eternal, there has to be some change in the condemnation. That's why universalists say, well, that, that, that's when God's going to save them out of hell. He's going to see the suffering, and he's going to repent that, that he's let them suffer so long. You know, I, I was talking to Justin earlier, and there's a woke preacher I saw, more and more common these days, these woke preachers. And they were, they were teaching children about Noah's Ark, and, and uh, the, the woman said that what is the consequence of Noah's Ark in the rainbow, and the symbol of the rainbow, is that God said, I would never do that again. He made a mistake, right? He made a mistake, I'll never do that again. I got angry, and I judged the world in my anger, and that's not loving, and so I sent the rainbow to show you that I, I'm not going to do that again. I'm sorry. It's like, wow, that really flips the script, and that, that this blames God for his judgment. That, that's typical for how people respond to God's judgment, is that it's God's fault that he really shouldn't do that. No, we don't deserve life. We don't deserve immortality. He gives it to us by grace. If you don't have immortality, you will die subject to death, and that will be your state in condemnation forever. There's no change in that status. 2 Timothy 1, verse 10. But see, I'm not dealing with translation here at all, okay? We already dealt with definition of words. We're dealing with just the context and the teachings of these passages. Seems to be 1 verse 10. It is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Talking about God's grace and the gospel and our salvation. It's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. Death abolished. Hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel brings you immortality, life without death. Life never ending, life everlasting. That's what the gospel brings you. What happens if you don't receive the benefits of the gospel? Let's flip the coin here. If you do not receive the immortality and life through the gospel, then death is upon you, and there's no way out of that. Like, this is the solution. The only way to be immortal, live forever, in the end, without end, is the gospel. Without that, you will not live forever. And you will face God's judgment. And that will be the place of position in relation to God that you are. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. So don't, don't be set off, put aside, or confused by when you, people question the eternity of hell, or the duration of hell, that they go to the linguistics and the words and talk about translation. Just read the Bible in your context to think about what it's saying and how you're saved from an unsavable position until Christ came. Well, if you're in that position un unable to save yourself, you're going to be that way forever. Yes. Like, that's the implication of it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53. This is how basic it is to say that hell is so long. It's so basic, we don't even really ask the question. It's like, well, of course it's, it's forever because we're saved from it forever. And the Bible talks a lot more about the eternal life that you have to have in Christ. Verse 15, verse 53. This corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Why is it such a great victory? Because death was going to hold people forever. It was the strength of it could not be defeated by people. But Christ conquered death, right? This is the gospel. But without Christ conquering death, what happens to those in death and condemnation? They're stuck there forever. So the, the length of hell isn't the problem. The length of judgment and condemnation isn't the issue. It's how you get saved, which is what we've, why we've already addressed that in our past lessons, how atonement's applied by grace through faith. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. 
2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, let's start in verse 17. Our light affliction, which is our life now and the sufferings we face, is, is but for a moment. That's not eternal, right? Our, our light afflictions now, talking about saved people, are momentary. And it works for us a far more exceeding and an unspecified but duration of time weight of glory. No, an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. They're temporal. But the things which are not seen have a limit, only it's unspecified how long that is. No. The opposite of temporary is permanent. Amen. Eternal. That's what Paul's saying. So, what's the conclusion here? I showed you the passages that say, show you how long uh, damnation and judgment, the Bible says, indicates it is. And I've, I've shown from the teaching of immortality and eternal life how that the, con the consequence of not having that is being in condemnation forever. You cannot be a King James believer, let alone an ESV, an IBLT, or any English Bible believer, and be a universalist. You can't do it. You have to retranslate your Bible. You have to change the meanings of the words. Every place they show up. And they show up quite a bit. Now I want to talk about in the remainder of my lesson, not just about how long, as I've shown you the biblical evidence for that, and so the question is left to you, do you desire to retranslate your Bible and change the words in your Bible to believe universalism uh, and subject your belief in the necessity of everyone being saved to changing Scripture, or are you going to let the Bible stay as it is and let God be who He is? But I want to talk now about whether or not eternal hell is justified. I think it's clear the Bible teaches it and how long. But is this a just thing? Is God righteous to punish people for eternity? After all, we are finite beings. We're temporary beings, right? And we have this lifespan which is temporary. It's only a moment in time. 2 Corinthians 4 said that. And we commit just an, a numbered amount of sins. It's not like infinite number of sins. It's just there's a large number probably, but it's a really big number. But it's still numerable, right? Um, and so how can committing numerable sins, a few million, billion, I don't know, equate to forever? Like, how, how is that a right compensation for the finite sins of temporary beings? How can God justly punish for eternity people that aren't eternal in themselves? This is a question, it's a valid question to ask. How, is, how can this be if hell is eternal? Which, like I said, the Bible teaches implicitly. And I want to cover some of the principles on why that's justified. Number one, the punishment of God's righteous judgment is not determined by the speed of the crime. It's not the time of the crime that's the issue, but the cost to repair it. You know this to be the case, okay? It only takes a moment to blow up a building. It takes a long time to rebuild it, right? So punishment isn't based on how long it takes you. Well, I only committed a crime for 10 seconds. Yeah, but you just killed 50 people. It's only 10 seconds worth of crime. It's only one crime, right? <laughs> Yeah, but the cost to repair this, the quality of the crime, the caliber, the, you know, there's other issues to, to evaluate here. In, the, in this specific case, the cost to repair sins and to atone for them is the Son of God dying. Yeah. Now, I know people who don't care about the Lord, don't care about God, say, well, who cares? But this is the Son of God. This is not just the best of us or the, the most perfect lamb among the flock. This is like the Son of God who came down, put on humanity in incarnation and all the su sufferings and burdens there, there too, and all the humbling, and then died facing false accusation and death in order to atone for your sins. This is a high price. If you didn't know, it's a high price. Amen. Right? And so the punishment for sins, unredeemed by not trusting the gospel, receiving the gospel by Christ's work, it's not determined by the speed and how long it took you to commit the crime or how many crimes you did. It's based on the cost to repair those crimes. Yes. The eternal Son of God. And His life was given. Okay. Number two, punishment reflects the dignity of the one who's grieved. When you commit a transgression, a sin, an offense to someone, the punishment should, if it's a righteous punishment, reflect the dignity of the one grieved. Pulling the fire alarm at your local public school will get you in trouble. But not so much as a politician pulling the fire alarm before passing a law in Congress. In the news just recently, right? What's different about those two things? 
it's just a fire alarm. Everybody does it. It's cool. It's like, uh, Congress? Like, this is supposed to be an austere institution. An honored, an honored thing. It's the dignity. That's the idea. It's a righteous thing. Okay? You hitting the bully in a school fight in the park is different than you walking up to the president and punch him in the face. Like, there's a dignity to the office, to the person, to the thing that you've offended that changes the punishment. All right? Now, apply this to your sins. You've sinned against God. A holy, pure, infinite, eternal, only God. Your maker, even. Right? Hitting your bully friend and hitting your mom are different. Well, they're just people. One's your mother. What do we mean by emphasizing mother? Like, there's a dignity to that. There's an honor due to that. So when you sin against God, you say, well, I just sinned against, I just sinned, I saw all sin. You sin against God, the eternal, infinite, holy God. And all of us did. That's why the punishment doesn't, in your mind, equate to the, the crime, because you don't appreciate who you grieved. So, eternal punishment? Why? Because God is infinitely and eternally holy and pure. That's not the only reason, though. I'm, I'm, this, this, is just re- this is ways of adjudicating your crime and how it's irrelevant the time. Time's not even a factor in some cases, uh, uh, in areas of judgment here. Punishment, for example, reflects the height of the power and authority of the rule. Okay, here's the example in, in our civilization, okay? Um, not all, but it's a standard, a general rule, that if you commit a federal crime, you get greater punishment than, say, a local crime, right? You, uh, you commit some local ordinance infraction in your small town or city, different punishment than federal crimes, which is why when you attach that to the end of your crime, well, that's a federal crime. Ooh, federal. Well, it's a higher authority. I guess the point, it's like there's local, there's state, there's federal. It's a higher authority. You've offended a higher power. Now, that's just earthly powers. God is the highest power. Even though you offended some inferior authority of power, you go into a classroom, in the little kids' class over here, they got rules. There's rules in the classes over there. You can ask the kids, they know the rules, right? You go in there, you break one of the rules of the Sunday school class, right? Doesn't deserve eternity in hell. Doesn't, right? You offend God's rule, mm, that's different. Higher power than the rules in the little kid's class. Okay? Lesser authority. Do you see the difference? So it's not just, oh, it's just a sin. Against who? To what power and authority did, oh, was the rule that you broke? Right? What was the dignity of the one that you grieved? How much did it cost to repair what you broke? The crime you committed, what effect did it have? We covered this a few weeks back in our lesson on Holy Hell, where God judges not just the sins you did, but the effect it had on other people. Because your sins have effect. So you say, well, I just committed this sin. So did that guy. But your, your sin had an effect. That multiplied here and there. That makes it worse. You see. But today I'm just dealing with the, 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 the height of the authority. Punishment is not only determined by the quantity of the sins, but by the class or kind of sin. And so if you're in law enforcement or, or, or you understand criminal justice like that, there's infractions, there's misdemeanors, there's felonies. Those are classes of crimes of offenses, transgressions, that have different punishments to them, right? Well, what level is that? Well, that's just an infraction. What's that mean? You get a ticket, 20 bucks or something, you know. That's a felony. That means you can't carry guns anymore, you know, <laughs> whatever that means. Yeah, that means you're going to jail for a long time. You know, that's a felony. Bigger punishment. Why? It's just one sin. It's not the quantity. It's not the length of time that you, you used to commit it. It's the class or kind of sin you committed. Unless you say, well, I haven't committed some great sin against God, and I'm not a murderer. Jesus said, if you're angry at your heart without a cause towards your brother, that's like murder. Right? Well, I, I'm not like a rapist. You mentioned last week the people that are in hell, and, and there's very wicked people in humanity, like we all agree, are very wicked people. I'm not one of those people. We're all sinners. And the most heinous sins, the most reprehensible sins, are spiritual. They're not crimes like theft or against another person in the flesh. They're spiritual, like pride, for example, which is the devil's sin. The devil's sin was pride. And you exhibit the same sin against God. That is a very heinous sin against the highest power and authority. You see, that's a pretty 
pretty strict bar. It's like, yeah, that's why we're all sinners. And that's why we deserve judgment. That's also why God, by his grace, extended salvation to you all. Pride, idolatry, which is rejecting the one true God for a God of your own making. That's a very heinous sin. This world doesn't condemn or punish that, but God does because it's one of the worst. We talked this morning about the need for man who has soul and spirit to be connected with God, and when you place God with some false God, you're creating a mess just in people's lives and their walk, and this is why adultery is so, so grievous. Deception. People don't think lying is that bad. It's terrible. Uh, they'll speak out of both sides of their mouth. Lying's not that bad, but we need to come to it, the truth. We need to speak facts. We can't do that if you're lying. Well, they're just small lies, but you're teaching other people to lie. And they think they're small lies. You get all these small lies, and it turns out to be that, yeah, we're living in a deceptive world. Being dishonest. Angry. These are, these are the most highest reprehensible sins. How do you know that, Justin? How do you know which sins are worse? Read the scripture. Proverbs 6, God says there's six things that I hate. Be seven. Two of the six include lying. Like, he brings up dishonesty and lying twice, it seems like. Pride's first on the list. He doesn't even say, even though there's killing in the list, he's not saying some of the crimes you might think are bad. The crimes you think are the worst crimes are usually the crimes that have the most um, obvious social consequence to you. Those are the ones you think that are the worst ones, which actually shows your depraved nature, because really what you're concerned about in the extent of the crime is not whether it's right or not, but whether it's going to affect you greatly or not. So certain crimes in society have punishments that affect your social acceptance greatly. Remember canceling? Is that still a thing? I don't know. I like to put these things behind us. Like, like th th those things turn into grievous crimes. Why? Because the social consequence to people really hurts. Right? Like, that's a real reaction. But that doesn't determine the extent of the crime. God does. You see? And so, a lot of times, the most uh, grievous sins go unnoticed by people. Because we're not going to punish anyone else for lying, being proud of themselves. Because we're all a bunch of sinners. We don't care about God. The punishment must fit the crime. Yes, my point. Eternity in hell doesn't fit the crime. Actually, um, if you sin against life, life itself, like what does that mean? God gives you life. He gives you an opportunity to breathe and live and choose and think and do. And you sin against the giver of life and life itself, like a rule of life. I didn't know there were rules of life. Uh, God, scripture, conscience, there are rules of life. And you sin against life, guess what? Life gets taken away from you. Amen. That's a punishment that fits the crime. Oh, no, 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 you can't take away my life. I have a right to life. You have no right to life. God gave it to you freely. Right? It was a grace. And so the sin against life means life is taken away. If a sin against life in time, like you've sinned against the time you have, Life is taken away for all time. It's not given back at a certain point. This happens all the time. Right? You commit enough crimes with guns, guess what? Or maybe one crime with a gun. You don't get guns anymore. Just as an issue of, in our culture. Among other things. You don't get to practice your permitted practice of, say, cutting people open with a knife, surgeons. You commit a crime, you're done. They don't let you back. It's not like, oh, okay, it's been what? Five years, okay, give him his knife back, you know. Like, you, 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 you break the rule of that action, it's taken away forever. You don't get permission. What about life itself? Well, that's what judgment and curse in hell is. Life is taken away forever, okay? Some outcomes are unaffected by the length of time. You say, well, how long are they going to be there? Well, it doesn't matter how long. Right? It doesn't matter how long. Some, some things aren't affected by time. Again, I bring up children as an example of this. Sometimes you put kids in the corner, not because you want them there for five or ten minutes. You want them to change their mind about what they did. Now, we'll deal with repentance next week in hell or not, but sometimes the outcomes aren't affected by, the, by time. When you get divorced, for example, God forbid it happen. Let's say you get divorced. Um, the fact you've been divorced for one year, five years, ten years, twenty years does not change the fact that you're divorced. Well, I've been divorced for 50 years. I should be remarried again. Like, no, you don't get married by being divorced for so long. It's like, that's, that's not how it works. So I go to hell. Well, how long has it been here? Well, you're in hell. That's just how it is. Like, it doesn't change. That's the outcome of the consequence of your actions. You say, well, how long has it been? It doesn't matter how long it's been. 
The length of time has nothing to do with it. The punishment is not the, the time, the punishment is the place. The punishment is the condition, the state. Okay? You get a, 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 a life sentence in prison, right? You're sentenced to life in prison. How long is that? Well, at the end of your life. It's an unspecified duration of time. You're in there for a long time, you're going, well, it's been quite a while. I think I deserve to get out. No, your sentence was life in prison. Forever there. You see? Decay is the same thing. If you are exposed to decay, the longer you're exposed to that decay, it doesn't make it reverse. Right? I put a banana on my counter, it gets old and moldy. If I wait long enough, maybe it'll come back and be fresh again. You know, it's not going to happen that way. Some outcomes don't work that way. You get consequence in hell, it doesn't get better from there. It's not that longer time you spend in hell in a decayed state that you're like, well, I guess we'll, we'll get life eventually. Death is like that. When someone's dead, they're dead. Right? The Christians say, what about Christ? Exactly, Christ is the way of salvation. But we're talking about hell and death, right? So when you're dead, that's it. Without salvation, you're, you're dead. How long? What kind of question is that? When you're dead, it's forever. That's the nature of being dead, right? It's like even a silly question. So to object to the length of time that one is dead is really odd. When your life is done, you don't get it again, right? Be saved. Have eternal life. Love life in that way. When you're disqualified, you're disqualified. You ever been disqualified for something? That hurts, right? Like you apply to, to be something, to be a part of something, or to, and sorry, you don't meet the qualifications. Disqualified. Like, it's like a personal, it's like, oh man, I didn't meet the standard. This kind of sounds like God's judgment, right? To meet the standard. When you're disqualified, you're disqualified. The length of time doesn't make you any more qualified. The bar doesn't lower to, the only time it's happened to me is some government law. It's the only time it's happened to me. Government changes their standard all the time. I'll be disqualified at one point, suddenly I get a letter in the mail, suddenly you're qualified. Like, what did I do? Nothing. I did nothing. They changed their law. God doesn't change his laws. It's like, that's the law. So you're disqualified, you're disqualified. If, you're, if you ever lose a contest, the amount of time after you've lost doesn't make you a winner. Like once you've lost, the game's over. But I want to be a winner. But you lost. Like the reality is you lost. Well, what if I wait 10 minutes? What about 10 years? Can I then claim to be the winner? It's like, you lost, it's over. You're in hell, you're not in hell. When you get in hell, and everyone alive on the earth who's unsaved is not in hell, they can be saved. Once you're in hell, you've, you're lost here, you didn't know, you're lost there, you, you, don't get, you don't get victory. Okay, It's a permanent state. Not to mention the fact that time does not remove guilt, especially time in hell. You get condemned guilty of a crime, you get thrown to prison for your sentence, and you say, well, are you guilty? You say, well, that's why I'm here. No one's guilty in prison, right? That's what they say, but you say, I'm guilty, that's why I'm here. And Ten years later, you get less guilty, right? Like time removes guilt. Well, I've been here 15 years. I have paid off my guilt. I'm no long, I have no guilt. Why do you have no guilt? Because I was there for such a long time. Well, no, even when you serve the sentence, you're still guilty of the crime you committed. You just served the payment, that's all. So every criminal comes out of prison who served their time righteously is still guilty. They've just paid the, paid the fine, all right? So you're in hell, you say, well, how long? Well, as long as they're guilty, which is forever, okay? Because the guilty get punished in the Bible. Now, here, here's, a position, here's a statement that some people make, and this is not necessarily, you can't, even, you can't find too many uh, passages of the Bible describing things like this in hell, though a couple. What if sins continue in hell? Can you continue to sin in hell? That's a lesson I will not teach as part of this series, but if sins continue in hell, say like blasphemy, then wouldn't the punishment continue? In Revelation, other places, there's cases where God pours out his judgment, and instead of causing this, uh, the, the people to repent, it actually causes them to blaspheme God. Well, that's just adding to your sins, yeah. right? And so the, the reason why that's suspect uh, as far as the punishment is because the judgment's already happened, right? 
But the point is their condition as sinners continues forever. The damned, those who are in hell, those who are unsaved, and you, before you knew Christ, do not deserve heaven. You cannot earn heaven. And those who we covered before go to hell, choose that. They choose rather to reject salvation on God's terms, which means they do not want to go to heaven where God is. The word heaven has an interesting origin, which has to, be, has to do with where God is. That's where it comes from. So it's not just, heaven is, is not, is, it didn't come from the idea of whatever makes you happy. That's, that's not heaven. Heaven is where God is, up there. You know, that's kind of the origin of the words. And uh, people don't want to be where God is. That's, that's why they're happy with their sin. They want to be saved from hell on their own terms. Right. Revelation 16 is an example of that, where wrath can harden people's hearts. It's in 16, verse 9. It says, men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over those plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. They didn't repent when he pours out his wrath. They're not even dead yet, but they're not repenting. They see Jesus, they're not repenting. They see his wrath, they're not repenting. People have the optimistic hope that, you know, if only Jesus would come down from heaven, he will, and they won't repent. Okay. So things do not change for the better in hell. Ta more time simply leads to more corruption and more decay. The guilt remains. Time doesn't change anything. So eternity is not an unjust consequence to those that are judged for sin and rejecting the gospel. And we'll cover this next week in more detail, but there's no way out of hell. So, I mean, there's no way out. So if, if hell is a limited thing, then you're going to get out one way or the other. You're going to either cease to exist, as annihilationist says, or you'll get saved out of it. Well, the Bible says it's forever, and there's no way out of it anyway. So even if you could escape, there's no escape. Hell, actually, as we covered before, shows the treachery of rejecting God's grace. It'll be a memorial to the treachery of rejecting God's grace and, and for sin. And it'll show the glory of God's salvation. Okay? Which means that an eternal hell, and adding to the length of time that people are facing God's righteous judgment, actually extends the glory of God, not by the sins and the sinners in hell, but by his righteousness to judge and to save. Amen. That's how that is. So, um, complain, uh, objecting to the length of time of, of hell or judgment uh, really is unjustified in the scripture. And, and lastly, I want to talk briefly here just about the relation of eternity uh, in the Bible to your life, which you know clearly to be the, receiving eternal life through Jesus Christ is a thing. Um, the problem of denying eternity as a word and everlasting and forever affects more than just hell. It might be that you say, well, this, this is really convenient to, uh, to diminish the threat of hell upon, upon people, but at the same Lord Jesus who talked about everlasting punishment, who talked about eternal damnation, the same words of God, the same scriptures, gives life and salvation for the same duration. Right? And so it has a consequence of questioning what kind of life you get and for how long. The only reason why this is not a problem for the universalists is because they have the premise, they have at the outset, the assumption, we'll cover this next week a little bit, that everyone's going to be saved anyway. So this is implicit that it doesn't matter. Everyone's going to be saved. Okay, that everything is judged by that. But for those of us who don't have that implicit assumption, we come to the scriptures and say, well, how can I have eternal life, a forever life, be changed to eternal and forever? I still have a question. I mean, okay, I get life for a period of time, but I want forever life. How does that happen? Right, we still have the open question then. How do I get eternal life? It's not answered. You just get a period of time, unspecified life, but not forever. But salvation is eternal in the Bible. The life in Christ is eternal. Okay. In fact, in the Concordant Bible, I keep mentioning that Bible because that's the one that's preferred and used by those who want to retranslate the words to justify not, not believing in eternal hell. You know what also is not in that, that, that Bible? Eternal is not in there. Everlasting is not in there. Forever is not in there. And the word hope is not in there either. It's, just, it's a terrible translation, folks. It's just terrible. The word hope is not in that Bible. So quite literally, there is no hope of eternal life in the Concordant Bible, like using those specific words. Now, universalists claim everyone's going to be saved, so they will teach hope of everlasting life, but they don't get it from the Scripture. I think translated rightly, right? If God does not give eternal life in Christ, it's a different gospel, folks, Right? Well, you get saved for an eon, and an eon and eons, but eternity, that's something we just can't know about. It's like, well, this is a different gospel, okay? Christ died for the sins of the world. It's applied through faith and by his grace. You reject the need for faith. You reject the kind of God's grace. You reject that there's eternity. 
Like, what gospel is this? It's, it, it's despite the outright teachings of, uh, of untruths that you can be saved if you're trusting Christ's finished work on the cross for everlasting life, because otherwise, what are you trusting for? The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? It's the consequence of the gospel. That's why I put that on the top of your outline there. Because it's not just about the length of time in hell, it's about the length of time that you get life. Because if you don't get life for that long, then what are those who don't have life? How long do they get? They're related. Yeah. It's the same duration. John 17, verse 2, Jesus says, I know he's talking to his disciples here before the revelation of the mystery, but he says that life is eternal. This is life eternal. This is actually his prayer to the Father. Thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That he should give an unspecified yet limited time of life. No, eternal life. And this is life, that's unspecified duration for a limited time. No, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Titus 3, verse 5 through 7 says, You're justified by grace through Jesus Christ, according to the hope of eternal life. Titus 3, 5 in the, in the Terrible Concordant Translation says that you're saved by the bath of Renaissance. I don't even know what that's talking about. The bath of Renaissance. Your King James says the washing of regeneration. But this is the superior translating technique. Yeah. It's terrible. But this is what it resides on. The universalist argument against the eternity in hell depends upon changing the words eternity in your Bible. Because it's clearly there. You say, in English. Jesus didn't speak English. Yeah, that's the consequence. Well, of course he didn't. The gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can believe the word of God in your King James Bible, or any English Bible, quite frankly, and believe you get eternal life through Jesus Christ by grace through faith. Okay? So you do not have to spend a single second in hell. Amen. Okay? So the, the, the length of hell is, is something that you can be saved from. And thus we preach the gospel to save men from the, through Christ. Any questions or comments about, about that issue? Why did God just not destroy 